Hello and welcome to week 12 of History of Art 1. This is FINA H111, Prehistory to Medieval. Uh, my name is Dr. Aaron Schwartz uh, and this is being presented by Indiana University, Purdue University of Fort Wayne. This is week 12 in our semester of History of Art 1. Our topic for this week is Romanesque Europe. So, with our next slide, let's discuss a little bit about what this term Romanesque means and what exactly we'll be discussing this week. So what do we mean when we say Romanesque? Romanesque refers to something that is Roman-like and refers to the architecture of this time period. Uh, architecture, particularly large-scale church architecture, we will see will incorporate barrel and groin vaults and round arches, very much like what was seen in the Roman era. Uh, the difference being the construction techniques and the materials that are being used at this time. Uh, the Romanesque era dates from about the year 1050 to about 1200. After the year 1200, we'll be moving into the Gothic era. This also coincides with what is usually referred to as the High Middle Ages, uh, dated from about the 11th to 13th centuries. Uh, a little bit of some of the important historical events that we want to keep in mind here. Uh, it's in 1054 that we saw the East-West Schism that splits Christianity into Western Catholicism and the Eastern Orthodoxy. So we've already discussed that quite a bit when we looked at the Byzantine Empire. And you can see the Byzantine Empire here on the right side of the map. So we've already been looking at what was going on in the Eastern part of Europe during this time period. Now we're shifting back over to the western part. Uh, in the year 1066, we'll have William the Conqueror uh, will win at the Battle of Hastings uh, in England. He will overthrow the Anglo-Saxons in Britain and begin a period of Norman rule. And we'll take a look at that a little bit later on. We'll also uh, take a look at the life of a very exceptional person called Hildegard of Bingen um, and discuss a little bit about her importance and her contributions to medieval society. The Romanesque period is also the period of Crusades. It's in 1099 that we'll see the First Crusade. Uh, it's in 1147 that we'll have the Second Crusade, which was definitely a failure for the Europeans. Um, in 1187, Salah ad uh, will recapture Jerusalem from the Christian Crusaders. Uh, and in 1189, we'll have the Third Crusade, which will culminate in a bloody siege of Jerusalem, uh, but the Europeans are not going to be able to recapture that city. Uh, not until the Fourth Crusade, uh, which is where we will see the, the sack of Constantinople in the year 1204. Uh, that will lead us up to 1215, the signing of the Magna Carta in England, which will be the first time the king accepts secular limits on his power. So that's just an outline of what's going on. By the time we get to 1215 and the signing of the Magna Carta, we'll be within the Gothic era at that point, so we'll speak more about that uh, next week, most likely. As you take a look at this slide, um, we're going to see various kingdoms highlighted. So in the, the bottom part of the map, in North Africa and into Spain, uh, the Muslim dominions, we've already spoken a bit about the spread uh, of the Islamic caliphates across North Africa into Europe. We've already looked a bit at Cordoba. So this is contemporaneous with what we're going to be talking about this week. As we go up, we'll see the Kingdom of France is quite a formidable unit. Uh, Union at this time, and then we have something called the Holy Roman Empire. Now, the Holy Roman Empire is more or less what we nowadays call Germany, going all the way down into the main peninsula of Rome, um, main, or excuse me, the main peninsula of Italy, uh, even south of Rome, as you see there. So, Rome at this time is the head of the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, the Western Christian Church. And that church, that religious organization, is going to hold a great deal of sway and be the preeminent religious power in Western Europe. Um, but 
that's not to say that all of these Christians are getting along with each other. That's certainly not the case, as a matter of fact. We'll see a great deal of political and social and economic tension between the Kingdom of France, the Holy Roman Emperor, uh, and eventually the Norman kingdoms up in England. Uh, and you see, the Normans are, are also spread out from, uh, from England even to the southern part of Italy and Sicily. So it's a pretty complicated political map that we have here. Another thing I want to draw your attention to are these arrows, these lines that are connecting up all of these different uh, cities throughout the Holy Roman Empire and to the Kingdom of France and so on. These are our major pilgrimage routes. Uh, the Romanesque era was a time of great pilgrimages. What these are is where the Christian faithful, as either a show of repentance or a show of faith and dedication, there are a great many number of reasons uh, why a person might choose to do this, uh, they will go on a pilgrimage quest, which will, which are roads, quests that link up important Christian shrines across Europe. And you can see on this map there are a great many very important pilgrimage churches and shrines. A couple of our most important uh, sites are going to be the site of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem, which is not shown on this map, uh, but also St. Peter's in Rome uh, is an incredibly significant pilgrimage site. The reason people are, are going on these pilgrim pilgrimages, again, this may be an act of repentance uh, to absolve oneself of sin. Uh, it may be a, an act of thanksgiving. It may be an act of uh, asking for a particular type of blessing. Uh, these pilgrimage churches and shrines are usually centered around reliquaries, which is where we're going to find important religious artifacts, and we'll speak a little bit more about that a little bit later on. Um, but what's happening? You have hundreds, if not actually thousands of people at various different times of years during the uh, Romanesque period traveling on these roads from city to city, stopping at various churches along the way. Uh, and what we'll see is that the local church community in these cities uh, feel the need to build churches that are bigger and grander and more spectacular. One, just to have a large place to house all of these uh, pilgrims coming in, uh, and two, to actually try to attract more pilgrims to come to these areas. So the first part of our lecture this week, that's what we're going to concentrate on. Let's take a look at the development of these architectural structures throughout the Romanesque pilgrimage period. So let's start in the Kingdom of France. Uh, French kings are very keen to make sure that uh, they're building some big grand cathedrals that are going to attract a lot of attention from pilgrims and to show the dedication to the church in Rome. So this is the interior uh, of a French Romanesque cathedral at Turin. Uh, where we're going to look down the nave here, and I, I do want to draw your attention as much as I can. Uh, it's hard to do in this format, I know. I do want you guys to pay attention to the sheer size uh, of these buildings. So if you look at the bottom of this picture, of this photograph, you see all of these chairs, and you really get a sense of how massive this interior space is. We have some wonderful windows on the right-hand side where you can see all of this wonderful daylight streaming in. And as we move through the Romanesque and into the Gothic, uh, that's something else that I want us to pay attention to. How are these architects managing to get light into these spaces? How are they managing to illuminate these spaces in a time long before electric lights and so on? Uh, but as we look at this, uh, we'll notice these Romanesque features. Uh, it's built out of stone. Your book discusses a little bit about wooden roofs and the switch over from wooden structures to stone structures. But we, we see stone here. We see rounded arches and arcade going all the way down the nave. Um, and a little bit later on, we'll, we'll start seeing some uh, 
indications of groin vaults and so on. All of these are characteristics of the Romanesque, these large interior spaces using primarily stonework here or wooden roofs in other places as opposed to concrete, which is what the ancient Romans would have been using. Um, so we're having to develop different uh, architectural techniques and engineering techniques in order to build these massive spaces. We need these massive cathedrals, these big spaces, again to house pilgrims, because if you are a pilgrim in Romanesque Europe, you come to these sites, you uh, you pay your veneration, uh, you, you give your prayers, other sorts of offerings to the church uh, to show how repentant or whatever you happen to be. Uh, but in many cases, if you could not afford uh, a, a room in town at a tavern or an inn, uh, you, you may have slept here in the church. Uh, they may have actually sheltered you here as well. So these churches tend to be multifunctional uh, and very, very large, impressive places. Uh, let's take a look at the exterior of this building. So from the aerial shot of this building we're looking at now, we can see how far we've gone from the original basilican plans of early Christian era of the late Roman Empire. Um, we'll see that the scale of these buildings is much more intense. They're very, very large. We're going to notice that although it's basilican on one axis, where we have a major nave and some side aisles, we'll notice the emphasis of a large transept uh, right at the, not quite at the center, sort of off-center there, and in a large narthex uh, at the other end, that entrance there. And I'm going to be using a lot of terms uh, that are already in your textbook, so you should have read these already. Um, you'll notice at the intersection, at the nave, the basilican plan, and the transept, that exaggerated transcript, uh, in this particular example at St. Cernin, uh, we have a very large tower, a bell tower sticking up out of that uh, intersection. Not all churches will have this, and we'll notice just a little bit of variety in terms of the tower placements and the buttressing and so on. Um, but by and large, many of the churches we'll be looking at in this unit will have many similar characteristics. First of all, that massive scale. Second of all, uh, that sort of increased attention to the intersection of the main nave and the transept to create that Latin cross uh, appearance. Uh, many of these will have elaborate narthex and entrance areas uh, and we'll want to pay attention also where we can to the exteriors. As we look at this piece we notice some buttressing uh, but nothing in the way that we can see here of flying buttresses. Uh, so we'll want to pay attention to that as we move closer to the Gothic as well. Uh, the Gothic will start to uh, employ some different building techniques in addition to what we see here. And here's simply another view where we're seeing uh, the entrance of the building. And what we'll notice are the two main portals that would enter in through the narthex into the main nave. Uh, we'll notice that above that on the front facade is a very, very large rose window. Uh, that's another not uncommon characteristic of the Romanesque that will also be used in the Gothic. Uh, but as we look at that front facade, uh, this uh, facade that we're looking at, we see a lot of buttressing. No flying buttresses again, all engaged buttresses. Uh, we'll notice rounded arches around the portals. And we'll notice that at this point we really don't have anything in the way of exterior decoration. There are no statues on here, no inscriptions. Uh, we're leaving the architectural features of the buttressing and the brickwork to be the only decorative factors, besides obviously the window. Uh, so this is another feature of Romanesque architecture that we'll want to keep an eye on. Here's the interior of an abbey church of Notre Dame in Fontenay. Uh, dating from about 1139 to 1147. Fontenay is an abbey church. This means this was a church for uh, a an attached abbey of monks. Um, <clears throat> 
so not necessarily a church that would have been open to the public or a place where uh, large numbers of pilgrims would have gone to. Uh, primarily, this was a church for this monastery that was attached. Uh, as we look down this main nave, this is an interesting photo because there's no furniture or anything in here. It's very stripped down and bare. But again, we can see many of these characteristics of Romanesque architecture that we've noticed before. Um, one little difference with Fontenay is if we look up at those uh, at the barrel vault we'll notice that the arches do have a slight point on them. They're not too exaggerated but they have just a bit of a point. Um, the pointed arch is a feature we usually associate with the Gothic uh, however, this is coming from the Romanesque period, so it's showing us a little bit of the variety within this style that we'll see. Uh, besides that point, though, everything else in this room, in this nave, is very Romanesque uh, in terms of the use of buttressing, the vault work itself, the introduction of light through side aisles, and uh, the windows that we see. Uh, it has all of the other features of the Romanesque that we want to consider. So we'll take a moment to move out of the Kingdom of France and over into the Holy Roman Empire, what in modern day Germany. So this is the Cathedral of Speyer. Uh, it was begun about 1030. Uh, however, most of the nave vault work that we see was done later on from about 1082 to 1106. Uh, that is something to keep track of, especially if we notice different parts of these buildings maybe look a little bit different from each other. Uh, these are incredibly large-scale building projects, as you can see. This takes tons of material, uh, incredible amounts of manpower. Uh, sometimes if uh, we come into uh, a drought or a famine or the, a war breaks out, uh, plagues, uh, illness, I mean any thing that disrupts society during the construction of these buildings can interrupt obviously the construction themselves and in some cases some of these cathedrals were left partially built to only half finish uh, for a couple of decades before we're stable enough to start building them again a uh, lot of a lot of interesting history just within the construction of the buildings themselves but at any rate Let's actually look at what we're seeing here. We're up on the clear story uh, of this building, looking down into the nave. And again, you can see all those benches, all those pews at the floor to give us a sense of how far away we are and the, the massive scale. Rounded arches and an arcade going down a barrel vault. We see just a little bit of an indication of the ceiling there of groin vaults. And that's uh, an important use of the groin vault uh, within the Romanesque that, again, is something that we'll also see in and the Gothic as well. There is some interior decoration over here uh, in the form of some paintings. Some of these paintings date from a later time, so we're not going to spend a lot of time looking at them here. Um, so the Holy Roman Empire dates from about roughly 1027 uh, to about 1125. Uh, that's the rule, I should say, of the Salian dynasty uh, that will be some of our first Holy Roman emperors. Uh, in Rome, or excuse me, not in Rome, up in uh, Germany <clears throat> and the northern parts of Italy. So the Holy Roman Emperor is not the Pope. He is not the head of the church. We have the Pope, who is the Bishop of Rome, in the city of Rome, uh, and rules from the throne of St. Peter, just as modern-day popes do, uh, in the city of Rome. Uh, the Holy Roman Emperor is appointed by the Pope, it's a monarchical position, uh, but it's appointed and approved by the Pope, and it's sort of understood that there's this slight separation, that there's the Pope, who is ultimately the, uh, the Pontifex Maximus, to use a Roman term, uh, a Roman Latin term, uh, versus the Holy Roman Emperor, who's in charge of the military and conquest aspects of of the exploits of, of the Catholic Church. This will get complicated in medieval history because we have other kings, obviously. We have a king of France. We have a, a king of Burgundy. We have the kings in England. Uh, we have a wide variety of, of dukes and duchies and, and so on. Um, 
there will be some competition between particularly the King of France and the King of England and the Holy Roman Emperor. Uh, and eventually, as we'll see as we move forward in time, uh, the Holy Roman Emperor is not able to really maintain himself as a unified, powerful leader in Europe. We will see that the kings of France in particular will supersede him in wealth and power and prestige, all while still these kings of France still maintaining loyalty to the Pope, um, to the Catholic Church. This becomes a very... Uh, a, a very sticky and complicated political issue and we'll have to mention it here and there as it becomes relevant but obviously just in a lecture like this there's a lot I can't go into. Um, there will be a little bit of competition between these Holy Roman churches and the French churches uh, and as they compete with each other for pilgrims. And to come back to the issue of, of pilgrimages again this isn't merely or only an expression of faith. Uh, if we want to look at this in more practical terms, we have hundreds, thousands of people uh, traveling across Europe trying to hit all of these pilgrimage sites, trying to uh, give offering to these pilgrimage sites. Once pilgrims enter to a city, they need food, they need shelter. Uh, there's a lot of money to be made from the pilgrimage trade. Uh, and certainly we'll have communities in Germany wanting to draw the pilgrims into their communities and communities in France trying to draw them into their cities. Uh, so there will be a fair amount of competition between different cities and building these cathedrals. And that's going to be an element while we'll start to see this uh, race to build buildings that are taller and wider and more grand with more glass and uh, uh, this, this will definitely lead to a lot of innovation in terms of wanting to build these structures more and more splendid, much larger to try to attract those people and attract the money that they bring with them. Now we're back over in France uh, at the facade, the west facade of Saint-Étienne uh, in France, begun about 1067. So we're looking at the western facade and again I'll just point out some of the major Romanesque uh, characteristics. I don't want to be too repetitive here but I do want to make sure that you guys uh, are recognizing and can understand what these characteristics are. So as we look at the front facade again we'll notice that there is buttressing on the on the facade but there isn't a lot of exterior decoration uh, it's relatively plain where we just see the buttressing and the brickwork and so on we'll see rounded arches over the windows and over the main portals uh, we'll also see as we look at the lower part of the facade we'll see that it has been divided by the buttresses into threes and then in the center panel there are three Excuse me, there are three windows um, on the lower level and three win uh, windows on the upper level. Uh, the number three has important significance to Christianity and particularly to Catholicism uh, because it is a reference to the Holy Trinity. Uh, and so any variation on the number three will, will be a common motif. But we'll also see here are the inclusion of two towers. Now we saw this similar looking building uh, when we talked about the Carolingian Renaissance and we looked at a Carolingian building, uh, that same kind of idea of architecture with a major Westbrook uh, facade flanked on either side by two large towers. Most of the times they have bells in them. Those are the bell towers. Um, we're seeing the continuation of that idea that we saw in Charlemagne's era. Uh, these are bigger. They're going to be a bit more grand. Uh, we see a little bit more architectural detail, especially in the roofs of those massive towers. Uh, but again, this is an idea that began all the way back with the reign of Charlemagne, uh, all the way back in the 9th century. And here by the 11th century, we're taking those same ideas, we're making them bigger, making them grander, uh, funding them through the profits being gained by the city from the pilgrimage. Here's the interior space of that same building, uh, Saint-Étienne. Uh, and again, I don't want to 
repeat myself because you'll notice many of the same characteristics that make this uh, Romanesque. Uh, except I will point our attention to the top where we will see clear groin vaults with ribs. So these are ribbed groin vaults. That's something else that comes out during the Romanesque, is sort of an innovation of the Romanesque period, uh, and something that will be continued into the Gothic. Uh, and particularly when we get to the Gothic, we'll discuss a little bit more about the aesthetic effects of ribbed vaulting and what it does for the space. Uh, but for now, this is an architectural technique that's going to allow for the distribution of weight of these massively heavy walls and and roofs and think for a moment uh, all of the stone all of this brickwork the sheer weight pressing down uh, on this roof on on these walls uh, there is a lot of material here uh, and these medieval architects have to be extremely careful about how they go about distributing the weight the ribs on the vaulting here are sort of extra buttressing to help distribute the weight more evenly and more carefully. And if you follow uh, the ribbing as it extends from the center of the vault to the side walls, you'll notice that they seem to connect with those engaged columns that come all the way down. Again, that is extra buttressing. That's a way of beefing up the support of the wall uh, in order to make sure that we can hold these roofs up. Um, now we're looking at examples, pictures of, of buildings that are obviously still standing and have stood the test of time uh, for the most part. Uh, what we don't often get a chance to talk about in a class like this are all the times that architects failed. Uh, the buildings that collapsed, the walls that fell down, uh, the, the, the ceilings that caved in. That did happen, and we know about many times that that's happened. Um, there are concern with some churches still today uh, that they're not architecturally very stable any longer. Um, do keep in mind that when architects are drawing this up and they're trying to figure out the math to do these sort of pieces, I mean, obviously, they don't have computer modeling. They can't plug this into a program to, to see about it. They have to use their brains as best that they can to try to figure out the math and the geometry. But then other than that, we just have to build it and see if it works. Sometimes it did. Sometimes it didn't. Uh, so these are really remarkable buildings, not just in terms of the innovation uh, of the engineering techniques that are being used here, also, a fair amount of courage uh, to, to just go ahead, build it, and, and just really hope that you've done it right um, and that it will stay upright. In addition to pilgrimage churches, what we'll also see during the Romanesque period are the increased development of convents and abbeys and monastic life across Europe. Now this is pretty significant when you think about it. Um, during this time period we'll have increasingly large numbers of people who are moving away from public life and regular uh, sort of commercial interaction with each other to dedicate themselves to the church. Um, and we will have throughout the Romanesque on scores of people, hundreds, thousands of people who will dedicate themselves, men and women, uh, dedicate themselves to the church. Now that is significant because if we have thousands of people in Europe who are living in monasteries or who are living in convents, uh, living in a cloister like you might see here, this is what we're looking at here is a cloister, uh, that means they're not interacting necessarily with the rest of the community. Some uh, some monasteries did have a lot of interaction with the outdoor community, but it meant that you were removing yourself essentially from the political economic life of the rest of Europe. You didn't own a business, you weren't uh, a commercial farmer, you weren't beholden necessarily to a landlord, um, you know, you weren't, uh, you know, you, you were completely dedicated to the church. Uh, depending on what order you were in, you were probably not married or have or having children. Women, particularly if they became nuns, were not having children or getting married. There were some orders of monasteries for monks, uh, 
Uh, for men that did allow them to marry and have children, it just depended on what order you were in. Uh, also, just a side note here, at this time in the Catholic Church, uh, it was permissible for priests to be married and have children. That was um, that was not always the rule that, that priests had to be celibate and unmarried was not always a part of the Catholic tradition. Um, and at this point in the Romanesque, it was not a part of the Catholic tradition. Uh, just a side note there. Um, but this will help sort of shift a balance of power across Europe, where we do have these monasteries, these cloisters, where monks or nuns are rather secluded from the rest of society. Uh, these will very often be the centers of... Uh, of learning and will become centers of education, universities. Uh, so it's beginning to shift the landscape of Europe, the predominance of these kinds of cloisters and these kinds of monastic communities. Um, to bring our attention back to the photo that we're seeing here, uh, we see this arcade around a central courtyard. This is a not an uncommon feature uh, in a cloister. When we talk about a cloister, what we just mean is a community that's uh, sort of secluded and shut off from outdoor, uh, the rest of society, um, outer society. That's not to say that they were completely sealed away and never had contact with anyone, uh, but many of these communities tended to be very self-reliant. They had their own farms, they, had, they made their own bread, they, uh, they made their own clothing. They were as self-sufficient as they could possibly be in many cases. Um, so what we're looking at here, we see a great deal of ornamentation. You might think that a sequestered religious order, religious community, uh, might have rather austere surroundings. That was not always the case. And we can see these beautifully uh, elaborate capitals. Uh, we see this arcade going around the courtyard. We have the repetition of double and single columns. So some beautiful artwork being made for these spaces by craftsmen who may have themselves been involved in the monastery. So with the development of these monasteries and these pilgrimage churches and so on, we'll see the development of a unique type of iconography as well. Um, we'll also get a few artist names. So Geldinus here, we have a name. We know the artist who created this. Um, what we see here is Christ in Ma Majesty, which is a relief from the ambulatory of St. Cernin. We've already looked at St. Cernin, the building. Uh, this entire thing is about 4 feet 2 inches, so it's a pretty substantial size. It's done in a fairly low relief. We see Christ enthroned. He is surrounded by this oval shape that's called a mandorla, uh, and it's a type of, you could think of it as a full body halo. So he has the mandorla, but he also has a halo just around his head. Uh, we'll notice that there is a cross on that halo. This is a youthful Christ without a beard. Uh, he's enthroned and he's giving uh, with his right hand that symbol of blessing. On his left hand, we see he's holding a book. Uh, we see figures. We see an eagle, a man, uh, a bull, and a lion. These are the, the symbols of the four evangelists that surround the mandorla here. Um, it's a very flat depiction of the body. We notice it's not very realistic. The eyes are wide and staring. The body and the, the folds of the cloth are very flat and patterned. Uh, Geldinus is probably drawing from a Carolingian or Ottonian example. He's probably looking at an illustrated uh, manuscript uh, that has an image of Jesus that's very similar to this. Um, but we'll begin to see the development of this medieval style um, of representing the body. Because as you recall, when we talked about the the iconoclastic controversy when we were looking at the Byzantine Empire, uh, while there was a reaction against images in the Byzantine Empire, over in the western part uh, of Europe, in western Christianity, there will be an embracing of images. However, it will take a while for these uh, medieval Europeans to figure out exactly how they want to represent the divine. So we'll see them drawing from many different sources. We'll see some examples like this one, which are quite abstract. We'll see a few other examples that are a bit more classical in their realism. Romanesque 
depictions of divinity are very diverse. There's a, a lot going on here um, as the church expands, uh, as it gains more wealth, and it tries to sort out what its iconography should be. Another example of an artist trying to do this is here, with this frieze giving us the creation and temptation of Adam and Eve. Uh, this is in Italy, from a cathedral down in Italy. It dates from, to about the year 1110. Uh, it's about three feet high, to give us a sense of our scale here. This is a wonderful little piece. It's a continuous narrative. So it's telling the story from the, uh, the book of Genesis of the creation, uh, temptation uh, of Adam and Eve. So on the left hand side, on the far left, you see two angels again holding a mandorla. We see a figure in the center with a halo holding the book. Uh, and that is God. That is God the Father, God the Creator there. Uh, so in the beginning there was God and we see that, uh, that depiction there. To the immediate right of that panel we get the next panel which shows God again with the same halo and everything creating Adam, sculpting him out of clay. Uh, on the panel to the right of that we have the next step in the story where Adam has been put to sleep and God has taken a rib from Adam and he creates Eve. Uh, so we see Eve rising up behind Adam. And if you can see on this slide, these figures are labeled for us. So we see the word Adam above Adam's head. We see Eva uh, or Eve uh, over her shoulder. On the panel next to that, we see the next step in the story, which is where we see the, the tree of knowledge and the serpent offering the fruit to Eve, who has already offered the fruit to Adam, and Adam is about to take a taste of it. Um, and so we see the temptation and eventual fall of man. It's a wonderful pictorial narrative. Uh, it very, very clearly spells out the story. Uh, we'll notice how the figures are represented. They're a little bit awkward uh, in terms of their proportion and how they stand. We're still seeing that kind of early medieval style with uh, the, the lack of classical proportion. Uh, but the figures are still expressive and there's a lot of detail. So even though there's not much in the way of perspective or proportion, these are still uh, very skillful images. Uh, very expressive images. So we should not attribute uh, what might appear to be uh, a lack of sophistication in terms of the body. Uh, we should not uh, associate that with a lack of skill of the artist because the artist is, is clearly quite skilled in rendering this narrative sequence and in putting the detail and the expression into it. Um, it's just the demands of the church at the time don't necessarily want a depiction of naturalistic human bodies. Um, something else I'll point out here, not to, you know, not to be weird or anything, but if we look at Adam, we'll notice that Adam is not anatomically correct uh, when we see him in the nude. It's appropriate when you're looking at the uh, when you're looking at Genesis, when you're looking at the creation of Adam and Eve, uh, and according to the biblical story, when they're in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve are both quite happy to be nude, quite happy to be naked, because they're completely innocent and completely free uh, and one with nature and so on. Um, so we see them in the nude, but we see how the artist here has basically, uh, you know, not shown us all the details of Adam. He's covered up Eve uh, in the scene of her creation uh, because of the interest within the church of not showing those sorts of anatomical details. It may look, it looks a little awkward, I think, to modern day eyes when we notice those details, uh, but this is keeping in mind that there is a certain uh, hesitation to show that level of nudity within the church itself. And then on the far right hand side we see the inclusion of the fig leaves. Um, so that's where when Adam and Eve partake of the fruit of knowledge uh, they are now ashamed of their bodies and they cover them. But it's a really wonderful sequence here. How these would have functioned within the society, while we have certainly written 
examples of the text, and in fact, during the Romanesque and into the Gothic, what we'll see is the Christian Bible will begin to be translated into different languages, uh, including what we call the vulgar languages, uh, you know, French and German and English and so on. Uh, as the as the holy books are being translated and being brought into these churches and preached to the people and so on, uh, we still have to deal with the fact that a great deal of the uh, lower class population, the, the people who are not aristocrats, who are not nobles, uh, those people by and large tend to be illiterate. Um, and even if they can read and write somewhat, they're not going to have a very sophisticated vocabulary uh, and probably not able to fully read and understand the Gospels themselves. So churches will very often be full of these sort of narrative sequences as a way to reinforce the stories that people are hearing when they go to church. Uh, so a Christian person, even a, a rather poor Christian person at this time period, has been told the story of Genesis, has been told the story of Adam and Eve from the time they were a child. They go to the cathedral, they go to the church, uh, and then they can see this pictorial representation of it to reinforce that education um, and to reinforce those stories in their minds. Now we've already looked at some exteriors of these churches, the outside of some of these places, and we've noticed that the exterior facades tend to, tended to not have a lot of sculptural decoration on them. Now there will be an exception to that, and that will be in the tympanum space above the main portal. So again, your book will describe what all these terms mean. But we'll take a look at the tympanum space here uh, from the Church of Saint Lazare in France, dating from about 1120 to 1135. Uh, again, to try to give us a sense of how large this is, this is about 21 feet across. Uh, at the base of this tympanum. It's really quite amazing. Again, we have an artist named Gislabertus, and this is a last judgment scene. So according to Christian theology, the idea is that Christ will come back to earth, at which point uh, all people will be judged and it will be determined if your soul uh, goes to heaven or not. Um, and so that's what we're seeing here. These scenes were extremely popular during the Romanesque period, throughout the Middle Ages, as a matter of fact. Uh, and we often see them associated with either altar spaces or here on the tympanum. So the tympanum is right above the front door, basically, when you enter into the cathedral. Um, and it's a not-so-subtle reminder to the faithful uh, as they walk through that front door uh, of why they need to go to church. Uh, it was very much believed that the Last Judgment was a very real thing, um, and that in fact it was imminent, it could happen at any moment, Jesus could come back. Uh, and so, walking through the front door, you passed under the gaze of Jesus in judgment. And that's what we're seeing here. So that very large figure in the center of the composition, so we see we're using hierarchy of scale here, uh, that is Jesus Christ. He has a mandorla around him. We see the evangelical figures uh, around him. He's got the halo with the cross, so he's got all of those elements that we've seen before. We'll know that Christ, however, is highly exaggerated in this pose. He's elongated. The angles of his arms and legs are quite bizarre. Uh, and as we move away from him, we notice that the other figures in the composition are likewise quite distorted. Uh, and elongated, so we're again playing around with the iconography and the depiction of bodies in these spaces. Well, we'll notice as we look uh, away from the central figure of Jesus, we see a Last Judgment scene being portrayed uh, around us. So to our right, to the right-hand side of, of Jesus, uh, we'll notice that there are angels and scales weighing souls. Uh, so this is an idea that once you die, or once uh, once Armageddon comes and the last judgment is upon the earth, everyone's soul, everyone lines up, and you can see a long queue of people uh, at the bottom register. Uh, everyone lines up, and everyone's soul gets weighed. Uh, if your soul is pure, you will go on to heaven. If your soul is heavy with sin, you will be cast out into hell. In fact, you can see the angel 
putting a soul on one side of the scale. On the other side, you see a demon, a type of demonic figure, tormenting a soul on the other side of, uh, of the scale. Uh, so it's a wonderful narrative here of salvation and damnation, uh, of figures either gaining salvation or being cast into hell and, and being tormented forever. And this is something that we'll see. Not just in the Romanesque, but throughout the Gothic and then even later European Christian art, where there will be a certain reveling in portraying hell and damned souls. That's a, a motif that we'll see pop up again and again throughout Christian art uh, from the Middle Ages all the way through to the Renaissance. Uh, but again, I want to draw our attention back to the figure of Jesus in the center and the fact that he, he is so distorted there. Um, an idea behind why we might want to distort uh, the the figure of Jesus there is to make him different from us. Uh, the idea that we want may want to portray our holy figures as being not quite human, not to disrespect the figures, not to disre disrespect Jesus, uh, but instead to show the viewer. Uh, the, the Romanesque viewer who's walking through this door, that Jesus is not a man, is not a person the same way that uh, you and I may be people. Um, that Jesus represents perfection, and the idea of perfection is somewhat alien to us fleshy mortal human beings. Uh, and so in order to express that idea of division, and express that idea that Jesus uh, is a divine figure, a holy figure, and not just a mortal man, uh, will distort and abstract the body to make him look unusual, to make him look more than human, different from human. Um, this is just one visual strategy that we'll see, and it's not consistent throughout the Romanesque. We will see representations of Jesus that are very realistic. We'll see other representations that are very abstract. Um, so as I mentioned before, the Romanesque is a very diverse time period as far as the visual representations go. Um, but that's one possible explanation, a theological explanation, as to why artists may want to distort and abstract the bodies of holy figures. Speaking of slightly more realistic or classical representations of divine figures, we can see that here uh, in this baptismal font uh, from Notre Dame de Font in Belgium. This is a cast bronze piece, uh, a little over two feet tall, and we see around it uh, a baptismal scene. So this is a font in which uh, Christians would be baptized, and we see the scene wrapping around it is the scene of Jesus being baptized by St. John the Baptist. We see Jesus and, and how this photograph is framed. Jesus is right there in the center. We can identify him with his halo with the cross on it. There's also an angel like immediately above him. It's a little difficult to see what's going on with him there, uh, but that mound that's coming away from Jesus' hips, that's actually a representation of the river, the River Jordan in which Jesus was baptized. So we see this representation of the water, Jesus being submerged partially into it. Uh, John the Baptist then has his hands on Jesus' head, uh, initiating the baptismal rite. We see over to the side these angels offering up robes to Jesus after he comes out of the water. Um, so it's a very expressionistic scene. There's a lot going on here, lots of wonderful detail and a kind of high relief. The entire baptismal font itself, that entire basin, as you can look at the base, uh, we see these uh, we see these animals that are supporting it, uh, and all the animals look in different directions and have different expressions on their faces. Um, it's a really fantastic piece overall. Baptism becomes much more common during the Romanesque as well. Uh, it will become much more common for Christians to get baptized into the church, uh, not just on their deathbeds, but much younger, even children, and so on. Uh, that wasn't always a common practice with Christianity, but be it becomes more common uh, throughout the Middle Ages and into the Romanesque. Some beautiful work here. I absolutely love the, uh, the drapery of the robe. 
around John the Baptist there. You can see his hand holding his cloak, and you can see the definition uh, of the uh, of the cloth as it's pulled tight. Uh, if you look at John's legs as they stick out from under his robe, you see a definition of his kneecap and his, his leg there. Uh, there's some wonderful slightly classical elements here that, uh, again, it's just belying the sophistication of Romanesque artists uh, and the diversity of form that we'll see. But as I mentioned, baptism becomes much more common during this time period, and we'll see the development of baptismal spaces and fonts uh, coming into this as well. So we've been speaking about the pilgrims and their uh, their quest to go from church to church, location to location. And I mentioned early on in this lecture uh, that uh, the focus of many of these churches and shrines were reliquaries. So let's take a look quickly at uh, what that means and what reliquaries are. Uh, so a relic in a in a religious context uh, is an object of very important spiritual power uh, and objects of adoration. In the Christian context they're very often associated with body parts uh, or of sacred artifacts. So a Christian relic might include uh, a piece of cloth worn by a saint. It could include the actual physical remains of a saint, uh, meaning uh, their body or their ashes or fragments of their body. Uh, it could refer to uh, pieces associated with Jesus and the Holy Family. Uh, the True Cross, for example, is a relic uh, that's supposed to be the uh, a fragment of the actual cross upon which Jesus was crucified. Um, now, these are not just historically relevant or interesting uh, artifacts. In medieval times in particular, these were believed to have important power, spiritual and uh, healing powers. Pilgrims would seek out reliquaries, so they would seek out relics, uh, to go pay adoration to them, to pray in front of them, to touch them, to be near them. Uh, and it was very devoutly believed uh, that if a person of strong faith, of honest, earnest faith, uh, who made a pilgrimage, who then was able to touch or at least be close to one of these relics, could either receive a blessing from that particular saint, uh, who made that the relics themselves had the, the power, the holy power to heal people or protect people. Um, and this is very very honest and, and, and very fervently believed that a person of faith could receive these miracles, that God used these objects, used these relics to uh, as a demonstration of God's power uh, by performing these miracles through the objects. Many Catholic churches still today uh, house these reliquaries. Uh, so a reliquary, I guess I should uh, clarify, uh, is a, a type of container or shrine in which the relic would be placed. So this one is the reliquary of St. Alexander, and it dates from about 1145. This is from Belgium, so this is uh, would have been an important relic within the Holy Roman Empire. Uh, this piece purports to contain fragments of the skull of St. Alexander, and this was not uncommon, uh, where skull or bone fragments of, of martyrs and saints would be enshrined. Um, apparently the skull fragments are in this piece, but really the spectacular thing is the reliquary itself. Uh, it is gold, silver, repousse, gems, pearls, enamel. Uh, we see Byzantine style icon uh, enameling around the base of the piece. Uh, we see a portrait there, presumably of Alexander himself, um, done fairly classically. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a really striking um, portrait that we see there, wonderful stylization of the hair, uh, inlay eyes to give that, that wonderful diversity of look, all of these precious stones inlaid into the top. It's a beautiful work of art no matter what's inside of it. Um, but this does purportedly have the 
skull fragments of St. Alexander. These churches that we've been looking at, uh, these pilgrimage churches, very often had as their central showpiece, if you will, uh, a relic, a reliquary like the one you see here. Um, so it was extremely important for these churches to gain access to these relics. And your book describes uh, how certain churches get their hands on some of these reliquaries. Uh, in some case, there's actual theft that occurs and some grave robbing that occurs. Um, so n not always really pleasant stories associated with this. Um, and you can read your book for some more details on that. But these are fascinating objects and they really serve as uh, main motivating factors for a lot of the pilgrims during the medieval era. Let's take a look at another example of a Christian reliquary. So this is the reliquary statue of Saint Foy, uh, dates to about the 10th to 11th century. Again, beautiful piece, uh, over two feet tall, uh, gold, silver, jewels, cameos, uh, wonderful piece. Uh, this thing is hollow and inside of it uh, purportedly is the skull or at least skull fragments uh, from Saint Foy. Uh, <coughs> And it's a beautiful piece. Your book will describe this piece in a little bit more detail as well. Uh, but again, it's it's indicative of what a reliquary is. They are nearly priceless objects in their own right, just given the uh, the expense and exquisite materials that are used to construct them. I mean, just look at how this object is completely adorned with these jewels and precious objects. She's made out of gold and silver. Uh, I mean, it's it, it's nearly priceless, priceless just given the materials that are made. Um, to the adherent, though, to the faithful at the time that this is installed in the church, what's important is not the fact that this is a golden, beautiful work of art. Uh, what's important is that it maintains safely within it the artifacts of the saint, that it actually contains that holy relic. And again, Relics are purported to have healing powers and almost what we might call magical, mystical powers. Um, miracles within the Catholic Church at this time are a very real thing and can happen anywhere uh, at any time. And so the miraculous and the visionary are very much wrapped up in the idea uh, of these relics that adherents go to them and, and pray and make offerings and... Um, by doing so, will gain favor from God, gain favor from the saints, and so on. This is becoming increasingly popular here in this western part uh, of Europe, uh, and in what we'll call Catholic areas of Europe at this time. Keep in mind what's happening in the Byzantine Empire concurrently with this. So we're in the midst, or just after the, the iconoclastic controversy, there are icons and there are reliquaries in the Byzantine Empire uh, and a part of the veneration of reliquary statues and the veneration of saints remains and and relics and so on is also feeding into the nervousness that the Byzantines have and the eventual banning of images that we'll see in the Byzantine Empire at this time. Over here in the West um, the Pope and Catholic leaders and kings and so on will very much embrace this idea of reliquaries and icons and figural images, um, in large part as an expression of what of their unique faith, uh, separate from what we now consider Orthodox Christianity. Um, so we see different areas, different communities of Christians embracing different kinds of images, embracing different uh, theologies, if you will, um, related to their religion to distinguish themselves from each other. Regardless, though, uh, this is an amazing piece. It's a beautiful piece, an incredibly expensive piece. Uh, it's not enough to merely have the remains of Saint Foy uh, and put her on display. Uh, it's felt that to do honor to the saints, you must uh, contain these relics, you must make them secure within these magnificent works of art, um, surround them with these precious materials as well. We're getting the money for this, and we're getting the uh, materials from this, sometimes from 
private patrons who are going to donate these materials uh, from the church itself and the collections that the church takes. Uh, once a church like Saint Foy has an object like this on display and it's open for pilgrims to come, uh, they're going to reap the benefits of this. And again, from a purely practical standpoint, trying to take the religion out of it, um, having an object like this, no matter the cost and how one is able to obtain it uh, during the Romanesque period is going to be a windfall for that church because we're going to be able to tap into that uh, pilgrimage uh, market if you will and start bringing people by the hundreds and hundreds into the city into the cathedral uh, when they come they make offerings they give money they give things to the church um, and it's going to help really establish these churches as centers of the economic community So this will conclude part one. There is a part two to our lecture on the Romanesque in which we'll be talking about the role of women in medieval society and an important thing that happens uh, with the Norman invasion of England uh, and how that will begin to shake things up in Western Europe. So there should be a link that has appeared on this slide here. Go ahead and click on that for part two.